Okay, so hey, I'm Kim Shannon with PokerStrategy.com, and I'm here with Jennifer Shahadi. Um, hi, Jen. How are you? Hey, guys. Doing pretty <laughs> uh, well. Good, good. So, um, obviously, you know, for those of you who don't know, you're probably living under a rock. But Jennifer Shahadi is um, one of the grind dads. She is also chess master. Um, she's got all kinds of titles under her belt, um, and a phenomenal poker player um, as well. Jen, how'd you do in the main here at Borgata Poker Open? I busted on the last level of 1B, so that was pretty disappointing, but, you know, it happens. It's yeah. definitely a really interesting tournament. In, you know, in oh, what way? Well, it's it's a really good tournament. Like, a lot of people say that it's the, the best tournament to play in outside, like, the World Series Poker Main event in, in the U.S., and I feel that. It seems there's a lot of people here, you know, taking shots, so you get a lot of players who aren't as experienced. But then on the other side, there's also a lot of really good players. So you get that, like, that range that you might get in a lot of World Series events where you have totally inexperienced and then, like, really fantastic players. Sure. So it's it's always fun to kind of navigate that, you know, figure Talk. out which players you want to play pots with. and Sure. Talk to us, Jen, about what your strategy was coming into um, the main event today or well, yesterday. Yeah. I mean, it was just, like I said, you know, just try to... My strategy was just just to just to play normally and try to figure out like again which players are going to be like more more the ones that I wanted to like raise their blinds and which ones I wanted to get in pots with and you know it was pretty easy to figure out like one of the nice things is that if you have like if you know people in the poker community like they'll tell you like who's at your table so there's a couple guys I didn't recognize and people were texting me like oh that's that really good player and that I play five ten with and. So I, I was able to figure that out pretty quickly, and then mostly it's observing. Um, and sometimes you can really out-level yourself if you think too much about who a player is. Like, I got in a really interesting spot in one of the prelims where I had a really tough decision about whether or not to basically five-bed shove in this hand where I had very little fold equity, and I had, like, contrasting um, viewpoints based on my experience at the table and some information I got from a friend. Okay. And I always think that's kind of interesting. Like, you're playing at the table and you're like, wow, this player's been, like, really nitty, so I should fold. But your friend texts you and is like, this player's really aggro. And then I'm thinking, well, my sample size is only two hours, so I should probably go with my friend's advice, right? Sure. So that's the kind of thing where... You know, it's tricky. It's, like, good and bad to have that extra information outside of the table. Can you relive the hand for me and, and tell yeah, me Yeah, sure. I mean, it was in the six max, which I love. I love mean, Six max that. is great because you get to play so many more hands, so you're really able to, you know, just strategize a little bit more rather than knit it up as much, which is often the proper strategy, especially in ten-handed. So I... I uh, I just, like, I, I got in a double stack, but then I lost most of it. So now I'm about at starting stack. And the um, the blinds were 200, 400. And this older guy makes it, um, let me just try to make it, this hand was, like, two weeks ago, so let me make sure I have all the details right. Um, he he raises, he was an older guy, and he, but he'd been pretty active. Like, he was really old. When I say old, like, some people, you know, these, like, internet kids will call anyone over 30 old. I'm talking like he was, like, in his 80s. Okay. Like, he's 85. <laughs> he was old. <laughs> yeah. And so the blinds, he made it, he, he 3X'd it at 1-2. So, it, so the blinds were 1-2, and he made it 600. And this was the an level before the Annie's. Um, I had ace 10 on the small blind, and I made it 1600. Okay. And so the, the villain in question was a guy who'd been playing, in my view, really passively. Like, he had maybe three bet me once, but almost all the hands that we were in together, he flatted. Like, he either flatted the button or flatted the small blind. And um, he must have flatted, like, five or six times and, like, three bet me once. So from my point of view, and even post-slap, he felt like he was playing a bit passively. So from my point of view, he was pretty passive, but my friend texted me to say that he's actually really spooey. Okay. And maybe he was just waiting for the Annie's to kick in. So, like, I had these contrasting views about him. Like, I wasn't sure what type of player he was. Um, so he made it 3,500 with the effective stack. My I had, like, 9K, and they both had 12K. So, I don't know. It's just, like, a really tough spot with Ace-10. Because, sure. you know, when he puts in 3,500 and I only have a little bit over 9K, you would think I have almost no fold equity. Unless he's not paying attention. 
Like, if he think if he doesn't really count my stack exactly and thinks I maybe have like ten or eleven, he might just like side fold if he's really doing it on like a total bluff. So, anyway, I just think like against a player who's been rather passive, like their first their first four bet of the day, like normally I would fold there, but like based on like the information I had and also ace ten is like a really good hand, small line versus the big line, right? Sure. I eventually like decided to jam it in and he had, he had queens, so it was one of those wah, wah. Yeah, I guess like that was a situation where my instincts I mean who knows, maybe maybe he could have been doing it in the, exactly the same because it's a great spot. Like from my point of view I'm like, well, I've been three betting this guy in the button who's older all day. So this is a really good spot to just like four bet with very wide range, like any kind of blocker or something. So, you know. Sure. I mean, it's, I mean, at, at that point it's a flip and then you have to kind of decide, do I trust my instincts? Do I listen to my friend? What do I do? It's a tough spot, but I, I don't hate your move at all. No, I don't hate it either. I just, it was frustrating because it was, it's so close and it's one of those things that kind of haunts you. Like you're thinking like, then later you're thinking about like which players you would have played it the same way against and like how to kind of just tighten up your math like even better in the future you sure know? so when I um, ran into you earlier you were leaving the cash room did you play cash as well I didn't play cash I try not to play like a ton of cash right after busting a tournament because you know that's what gets everybody excited <laughs> although I've heard that the cash games have been really good cash um, games have been pretty soft I have to tell you um, and you've decided not to play just because well, I'm more of a tournament player also so I, I do feel like my my skill I'm, I'm better at tournaments than I am in cash at this point. But obviously, if there were a lot of really weak players, then I'd rather be in the cash game. So it's it's more just that kind of game selection thing. And sometimes the Borgata, it's like a bit hard for me to navigate that because you know you have to get on lists and everything. And sure. I don't know. I don't really know which players are, you know, fish. So sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's tough. It's tough. It, it's tough. I mean, if you know them and you can capitalize on it, woohoo. But if not, it is tough. And you're um, also pr- a pretty, um, you prefer online poker as well. Do you not? I love playing live for the social aspect and because I think, like, it's just fun that, like, if you have a hand, like that ace-ten hand, it kind of sticks with you. It's so vivid because you played it and, like, you were there and that was the only table you were playing and you have all this, like, physical information but I also feel that it can definitely screw with your head. And I like having the online as a balance to that, just because the sample size of live is so small that I think if you're running well, you can get you can get into your head that you're playing great. And if you're running badly, you're constantly questioning yourself, even in hands that like might be kind of standard. So I really think it's so important to balance that with online, where you can play a lot more hands and not feel as much like obsessive over a spot that, like, if I played it online, I'd just be like, oh, that was just a cooler. When I play it live, it's like, I'm like, was that a cooler? Or, did I play that hand wrong? Maybe I should have, yeah. Maybe, like, should I have been able to, like, figure it out, you know? So, I, I, and I don't, I don't I think that's really important. Like, in anything in life, I know, I noticed that from chess. And I think that's, like, something I really got from chess, that confidence is a really underrated skill. Like, if you have a lot of confidence going to help you so much in anything in life and that really applies to chess and poker as well so it's important to kind of protect yourself from that you never want to get into a spot where you're constantly questioning yourself because it's going to make you play worse of course you don't want to be the other extreme where you always think you're awesome but i'm not at that i'm not i'm not a risk for that like i mean i obviously i have some confidence and i have like like i'm proud of some of the accomplishments i have but like I don't think I'm the type of person who's ever going to be like, yeah, everything I did was great today. I'm always going to be like, oh, I should have gotten more value from that hand. Oh, I made a bad fold there. Like, I'm just that's just the type of person I am. So you, um, you're constantly um, trying to improve yourself and stuff like that. Where do you go when you're looking for, um, you know, like poker advice or or better strategy, or when you're questioning yourself and you're not sure if you played stuff right? How, where do you go to learn? Well, I usually go to, I usually, like, like uh, text hand histories to a bunch of friends who I think are really good, and then, like, get different feedbacks on it, like, different types of players, like, some more mathematical ones, and then some ones who are just, like, more experienced, um, so that's usually what I do, I mean, it's the best way, and then also I go to, like, Poker Stove or something, and just, like, plug in a bunch of ranges, and that, that helps, too, to make you feel, like, good about, but that's more on, like, on hands where you really can break down the math. There's a lot of post-op situations where it's, like, not so simple. 
-hmm. Are you, um, you're a big, you know, when you, is your approach to poker mainly mathematical? I think I think I kind of lean towards that, maybe because I have that test background and I like thinking about poker as a big math problem because that makes me feel like there is an answer to questions, even if there isn't always like one exact answer. I like to feel that I'm approaching that when I analyze ahead, you know? Sure. And so generally when I hear people talk who have that mathematical sense, that's like what excites me the most, you know? Sure, and you respond to it well, obviously. Um, do you have more caches? How's your ca your cash history? Have you cashed more online or in person? Or, you know, live poker? For Definitely morning? online because I just played a lot more tournaments online. I wasn't like, you know, I never played like, I never only did poker. Like I've always done like a lot of other things, especially in chess from coaching to the website that I edit, Chess Life Online to like my books about chess to you know just ri even writing about poker like I do writing for poker stars and poker stars women so it's never like I'm able to like grind 12 hours a day I've never done that but certainly online I used to play all day on Sundays and several nights a week and I would get to play many tournaments a week I can't really think about how many it was but I, I, you'd figure because I wasn't like a mass multi-tabler because I'm always trying to learn I like to play like I always preferred to play like four because then I could still think about things. Sure. Whereas when I played like 10, it was totally automatic. It's like totally automatic decisions and very harried and frenetic. So I tended to play like four tables at once. So that would probably end up being like, you know, something like 40, 40 tournaments a week, something like that, 50 tournaments a week. Yeah. Which is basically a whole summer's worth sure. live. Sure, So, yeah. And then live, I've, I've started playing a lot more since Black Friday because... Even though I still play online on Bovada, it's not the same. How does your strategy differ between online when you know switching from online to live poker? How what kind of stuff do you have to switch up um, to keep you know to stay plus EV? I think you just have to pay so you have to pay so much attention live and really try to like even like focus on um, like pinning down each player because you can't take notes on people, so you just really have to stay focused even though you're only playing one table at a time and sometimes it's really boring and you're not getting to play hands I think finding that focus is important and I also think it's really important to remember that if you're playing a 12-hour day especially in like these deep stack tournaments like the WPT that you're not going to be able to retain like a laser like focus all day so you kind of have to pick your spots you know sure. and like you have to be really really focused when you're in a hand or when there's a big pot but if you try to do that from hour one, you're going to be burnt out by the end of the day. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to work on that also. Like, not punishing myself if I don't notice something, you know. But sure. I, I really like to look for showdowns and, like, especially things like if you can find out, like, what kind of hands people are opening with. Because that, that's, like, really good information. Or what kind of hands people are three-betting with. You had a really um, interesting, some interesting thoughts on calling light and, you know, the... You know, you see a lot of people call light and, you know, get there or whatever. Can you talk, to, can maybe reiterate what you had to say about people that call light and, you know, how, how that works out? Well, one thing I noticed is on, in a lot of online tournaments, I started to build, like, really big stacks. And a lot of it, it sounds really bad and fishy, but, like, a lot of it was from just calling, like, with basic equilibrium ranges. Especially, like, you know, when you pass the bubble or, like, before, before the bubble period. It's like, it, you know... I wasn't trying to call much like tighter than equilibrium and I think that that's really important because then even though it seems fishy it's like you're getting big stacks when you win those showdowns and usually you're ha you have an edge against your opponent's range and I think that sometimes people tighten up too much in those spots and that's what I found I just found that like I was getting bigger stacks because I was not afraid to call like exactly equilibrium and Live, it's harder sometimes because people do a lot of times it seems, it seems in a lot of tournaments I play in at least because I'm mostly playing like the smaller buy-ins that that people are you know just generally tighter live because they're sitting here all day and they don't really want to bust out as much as as online when you know you can play like six tournaments at once and you can constantly reload so therefore you kind of have to adjust things as well but in general I think even though it feels like in poker that's always fun more fun to be the aggressor if you look at the math like if you if you're getting a, a three to five percent edge on something it doesn't really matter if you're the one calling off or if you're the one jamming you know sure um so what is next after this for you 
Um, I know that you have a lot of stuff going on with your um, chess. You, you t- talk to me for a second about your chess. Um, you know, chess roulette. I know you do chess roulette. You have a fantastic book, uh, I, Chess Bitch, isn't it? That's right, Chess Bitch. <laughs> and I know that you have like a handle somewhere called Poker Bitch. And I, before I, I do. Met you, I saw that and I was like, Kindred Spirit. Well, that's right. Uh, but, yeah, I know. And I, I, where can people get um, Chess Bitch? And we'll talk a little bit about what it's about and what, um, what it means to you and things like that. Well, I have an Amazon page where you can get Chess Bitch and Play Like a Girl. And it's also in different bookstores, like in Barnes & Noble. What's the link? Um, it, you go to Amazon and then just like search, search Shahadi. Search Shahadi? Okay. Yeah, and I've got, a, I've got a page up there. And then um, in addition to that, I do a lot of other things around chess, like a lot of chess art projects, like you mentioned roulette chess. Right. I was just in St. Louis. There was this wonderful chess museum there, and uh, I was playing games of roulette chess, which is kind of like a combination of chess and roulette, which that kind of thing fascinates me because one thing is chess is not as popular as poker. And one of the main reasons for that is that in chess, it's very hard for an amateur to be a professional because the professional basically always wins in chess. Like, even if you play 100 games, the pro will win 100 times. Whereas if Phil Ivey plays an amateur in 100 hands, he's obviously going to lose many of those hands, right? Sure. So, and I think that, that gives a thrill to people who are starting out in poker that with their instincts and, like, with the little information that they bring to the table, they can beat anyone. And chess that requires 10 years of work, minimum. Wow. So, I, I like, I love chess. I think it's a beautiful game. So, so historic, such a great combination of strategy and tactics. But I'd like to see it more popular. So, that's why I like to do things like roulette chess, where yeah, you, you kind of spin the wheel. <laughs> I mean, you're doing a bunch of hybrid stuff, no? Like, uh, uh, so you've got chess roulette. I believe you have uh, make it chess, which is a little bit different, but still um, part of you know, stuff that you're bringing to the table that's outside of the box that people maybe would say, hey, this looks kind of fun, you know? Um, talk to us about Naked Chess. Naked Chess was a was kind of an art project that I did. It was a reversal of a famous Marcel Duchamp photograph in which he played against a naked woman in front of his, you know, biggest work, The Large Glass. So as a feminist, I wanted to reverse that, so I played against a naked man. And this photo was so popular because they... The naked man also had like all these tattoos and he was good looking and we did a video around it. it became popular and I actually got invited to Amsterdam to do a live version. Wow. Of the Who won the game? I, I actually it was for the video it was a predetermined game which was based on one of Duchamp's games, but I, I would win every time. <laughs> he, was, he was an amateur player. Okay. Um, and what is your title? I mean, you, you are chess master, correct? Yeah, I'm a chess master. I also won a couple of U.S. Women's Chess Championships. I won a junior championship as well. Wow. So. Good for you, Jen. Thank and you. And what is next for you? Wait, well, real quick, before I try to segue into the end, talk to us um, about your work with Grindettes. What, what's happening with the Grindettes? The Grindettes is an awesome group of four women, Katie Stone, Katie Dozier, and Jamie Kurtzetter, who's here right now. I think she's still in the work on a main, actually. Woo, go Jamie. <laughs> exactly. And I just think it's really important, you know, there's a lot of, even though a lot of people think that it's easier to be a woman in poker because you get more attention and you maybe your bluffs get more credit, both of which are probably true, there's also a lot of sucky things about being a female in poker. And it's not like every woman who works really hard in this game has, like, some kind of sponsorship deal. There's a lot of really hardworking women in poker who are struggling just as much, if not more than men, to, you know, get to the tournaments, to overcome the variance, you know? And, you know, we were talking about it earlier, it's tough for women because there's so many fewer of us that sometimes it's hard to find people to split expenses with. So we wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are women out there who are grinding. They're not just, like, you know, models who are excited, you know, pretending to play poker or something. Royal flush girls. (laughs) (laughs) Royal flush girls are, are hot. (laughs) <laughs> and it's great to see more women in poker, and I understand why, you know, there's a lot of models associated with the game, because there's so many men in it. It's just the way that the market works. But I'd like to see women more comfortable, and I think we're all we're all very approachable. Maybe taken a little more seriously? Taken more seriously as players, as thinkers, exactly, because that's one thing I, even though there's been so much progress and people understand that women are accomplished in all fields, there's still some sort of, like, primal, like, Chauvinism that I think comes out in the poker table that you can you know that people think even if they know about my accomplishments and they know that I'm a smart person they still think that like a lot of women are in level one that they're not capable of like really thinking 
um, out thinking or leveling at any at any juncture at all uh, you know if, the, if you're in the hand you have aces or ace king and that's the way it is sometimes I mean it happens a lot and I, I, I think it's great for women to be taken more seriously and that, that's happened a lot I mean you see women like Amanda Lisa met you interviewed earlier you know being successful and people taking her seriously and it's just great when you know you have so many more women like that and I hope that it makes other women more comfortable to come to the game because it is very tough and to me, it goes back a lot to what I was saying before about confidence, that if a woman starts out playing poker, and especially now that we can't play online as much in America, which is terrible and hopefully will change, when you come to your first live poker tournament, you're going to be inexperienced. And if you're a female and you're inexperienced, people are going to kind of send to you. And even if that in some sense is warranted because you are inexperienced, I think that can like rattle a woman's confidence and keep her from you know, staying with the game and being passionate about it, so... If you could, just, um... Go ahead. So, yeah, just like the, you know... Say that that's part of the game. If Getting you could come up with one piece of advice for men about playing with women, what would you say? Um... It's an interesting question. I think that, that women might change gears a little bit more than you would expect. You really have to watch out for that. And which is a good thing. I, I, I've noticed, like, in women's tournaments... I've noticed this also with like with people who like a lot of like um, older players who are like maybe more experienced even if they don't have a math background. I I think it's dangerous to, to pin them down too much. They really they really tend to change gears, and maybe that's partly because women are better with like the emotional type things, so they can see they can sense when you've pegged them, and then they switch. I agree. That's yeah. That's a good point. I mean, don't um, keep us in a box because we could surprise you. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's the thing generally I think in general women are better at that they're better at like, like it's, it's a blessing and a curse I think men are have more like personalities that are very emphatic that like stay the same and women it's like for me if I'm hanging out with like a new group of people it's sometimes really easy for me to blend in and start kind of like adopting some of their like little idiosyncratic like little things that they do the way that they speak and, and that, that, you gotta watch out for that yeah. I agree. So um, you're doing pretty well. I mean, I the last two times I actually saw you in person, you were at final table both times. Once mm-hmm. at uh, at large, which is a small, you know, kind of East Coast degenerate fest, um, which is a lot of fun. But you final tabled that. Um, and I believe that was a mixed event. No. Yeah, I'm not even really a mixed game player, but I just was. It was. It was, it was really exciting. How did you really. manage to um, get to the final table, being a you know fairly inexperienced mixed game player? Well. Um, Bill Chen, who helps me with poker, and I'm, I'm his chess coach. Bill Chen, the author of Mathematics of Poker. And a total mixed game expert. Gave me, like, a few little tips in each game, and then I just tried to pay attention. And, you know, it's like a tournament, so and it was a one-day tournament, so the blinds went up pretty quickly. And then another thing that was awesome about it was that the final table was all no limit hold them, so it switched back to the game that I know. That you know, right. Yeah. So you just um, kind of winged it and did the best you could? And- I winged it and played tight, I mean. As I understand, like, if you're starting out in No Limit Hold'em, for instance, the, the correct strategy is always to be tight. Because if you're if you're starting out, you know, and you have constantly have stronger hands than your opponents, it's going to be a lot easier. And then when you get better, you can find out whether your natural stat strategy is to be a little bit looser or not, or whether you want to kind of stick with a tight aggressive style. But I think that when you're starting out, you want to try to be tight. Gotcha. And then after that, you final tabled... A, a, you know, a nice cash, right? At Delaware Park Poker uh, Classic. Shortly after that, tell us about that. That was a really awesome event. Even though there's so much variance in poker, there was something so fairy tale about it because it was my first experience. I've had a ton of experience with DCAP, and I love DCAP. I've done it, especially with adults, with children. I like to promote it with girls, but I had never taught poker before, and I was a little nervous about it. Um, but Greg Raymer invited me to be one of the uh, guest coaches for a seminar that he did, and I had just incredible experience. I loved it. I really felt that I was able to help people with some of the mathematical things that I'm good at. And then a couple days later, I came back, and a lot of my students were playing in the main event of the Delaware Park. So the fact that I final tabled it, it like, is so so fitting. It's almost um, karmic retribution. Yeah. yeah. What kind of stuff um, did you teach in the seminar? You know, what, what were some of your main um, presentation points? Well, it was actually like a hand history lab. So we would they, we would play 
hands, and then we would, after the hand was over, they would every, the players in question would turn over their hands, and we would discuss, you know, whether they made the right or the wrong play. And in general, one thing that you always find with amateurs, especially in this kind of context where there's no serious money on the line, um, they just play way too loose. I mean, they're... The ranges for calling and opening were just like way too wide. You know? So you basically um, your main uh, teaching point to them was how to tighten up and what to play and in what position. I mean, I, I know that I find that they have a tough time with position. Yeah, they have a tough time with position exactly. And yeah, they're at, they they pay a lot of attention to their absolute hand value rather than to relative. And then when the blinds got up, because we went through like all stages of a tournament. Um, we would talk about how you really then then people had the opposite problem that they would um, they would tighten up way too much and they were like well I don't want to stack off here with ace queen and even though it was like a you know it's kind of like twenty big blind cut off first big blind and this was really funny because in that spot they were they would they would they would, uh, they would not agree with me they refused to agree and I would just have to continually try to explain the math and and that's good though. Want that. Do you think they get it at the end of the day? It's hard, you know. It's one of those things in poker where sometimes people's emotions are too strong, and it doesn't matter how many times you logically explain something to them, the emotional part of their brain is just like in- incapable of accepting it. Or they need what they really need is a therapist. They don't need a poker coach. <laughs> but they're aces. Why the heck would I fold them? I can't <laughs> let them go. <laughs> Abandonment issues. So, um, did any of them, just out of curiosity, did any of them cash? Oh, yeah, and some of them were really good players, by the way. I'm just saying, like, the ones who were arguing with me about that ace-queen hand, it seemed that they had some emotional difficulties with it. Um, is, for instance, my dad. He's a fantastic fast game player. He's really good. I okay. Mean, he reads people really well. He, he, he hardly ever gets stacked. He's a little bit too tight, but he generally, like, is very, very profitable in any cash game he plays. But when he plays in a tournament, it doesn't matter how many times we explain to him he never wants to bubble. He'll blind off to make sure that he's not the bubble boss. And it's this emotional thing that, like, some people just can't get over with tournaments. Sure. That's definitely, like, more, um, yeah, psychological and, uh, you know, maybe part of your personality if you're an alpha personality or not and stuff like that. Um, but did any of them cash in that? Yeah. I, I think several of them did, actually. Good. Good. Um, I think that very shortly I'm going to run out of, I'm going to have technical difficulties with batteries. No. So. I know. So, I had so much fun, though, with you. I know. We had a blast. It was fun. Yeah. Anything else that... What's next for you? Next, um, I, you know, I got up, back up on Poker Stars recently, so anytime I, le- I leave the country, I would love to play in some of their events, especially their Poker Stars women's event. You cast in Monaco, correct? Yeah. Uh, Morocco, Morocco. Mo- no, it was Monaco. Monaco. Yeah, it was for their EPT Grand Final. I, I cast in a couple events there. Nice. Congratulations. Ones, so that was nice. And Monaco is amazing. So where can we expect to see more of you, Jen Shahadi? Probably more here in Atlantic City. I mean, I know that I got some other big series coming up, and you know, just trying to, to try to trying to uh, play a little bit more online and then close to home. And, and we can find you anytime on your website, which is what jenshahadi dot com, correct? It's jennifershahadi dot com. Jennifershahadi dot com. And then, like you, I'm a big fan of Twitter, so I update that like four times a day at least. And that's where you find the good stuff. Like, that's, that's where you find like, the inappropriate stuff. That well, that's what we all <laughs> want to know. So make sure you follow Jennifer Shahadi, uh, Jen Shahadi. Jen, that one's Jen Shahadi. It's at Jen Shahadi on Twitter.com. And um, congratulations on having a, I mean, a great couple of years so far. And we expect to see way, way more from you. And <laughs> Thank you. I, I had a blast. Always. It's hard not to have a blast with Kim Shannon. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> For Poker Strategy, I'm Kim Shannon with Jen Shahadi. And we're going to say goodbye.